Okay, um, good morning everyone. Uh, let me uh, first introduce our, us. So my name is Sergei Alkyanov, I'm working in Mirantis. I'm Senior Development Manager and the Head of our Fuel CCP project in Mirantis. Um, so uh, with me today is uh, Peter Prokop from uh, uh, Intel. He's a cloud software engineer and Quentin uh, from uh, CoreOS. He's a software engineer as well. So uh, the main topic for us today is to talk a bit about the OpenStack and Kubernetes and what we learned while running it on a, a scale and uh, on a different options. Uh, so we'll, uh, we'll have the following plan uh, for the day and we'll talk a bit, uh, first of all, about how we uh, take any benefits from Kubernetes to run OpenStack. And it's very interesting because like, Kubernetes provides really lots of the benefits that we can just reuse and uh, not uh, like develop our own stuff. Uh, the next thing is uh, obviously what's missing in Kubernetes and what we need to cover for us to run OpenStack. Uh, and it's mostly about the stateful services. And then uh, uh, we'd like to talk a bit about how it was working on scale. And we have uh, some lightning demo uh, in the very end, if we'll have time for it. I think we'll have. Um, so let's, uh, let's proceed. So uh, today we're going to talk about the two projects that were started uh, in parallel. It's a few CCP and Stackanetis. Uh, both of these projects are targeted to run OpenStack on top of Kubernetes. And uh, the main goal is to make it Kubernetes native application. Uh, not to run external orchestration or some like, black magic out of uh, Kubernetes, but really to make a Kubernetes application out of it. So uh, on this slide, you can see the comments to deploy OpenStack. So both projects using the metadata-driven approach, where you can specify the topology, configs, and etc. in the config files, uh, and it will be just used as a, like for the infrastructure as code approach or, uh, or something like this. And all operations are done uh, based on the metadata for the BOSS projects. That's like probably why we, three of us are today here and uh, sharing uh, uh, information about those two projects because they are like very similar but still have like lots of lots of interesting differences. Um, okay, so for for uh, for guys who know don't know what is Kubernetes. Uh, like what I can say, like for sure, is a, is a container management platform that's uh, doing a very very huge set of different pluggabilities, uh, like different networking, and different container engines, like Docker and Rocket. Um, doing the policies, uh, supporting the different objects and types for running the workloads in containers. So in general, you can think about it about uh, like like the OpenStack for containers and uh, the the world around the Kubernetes. It's an open source project started by Google and actually uh, driven by Google so far. And uh, like there are lots of companies joining it, and uh, there is a uh, like showing very very good growth uh, angle and uh, more or less showing the same the same story as OpenStack was showing like five. <laughs> Four years ago, probably. So um, let's. Uh, I'm like, passing the ball to Quentin. He will talk about uh, how Kubernetes actually using our life is easier. Hi. So if there is one thing that I learned since I started deploying OpenStack on Kubernetes, is that Kubernetes really makes our life easier. So through a little animation, I will uh, show you and describe you some of the fundamental uh, aspects of a Kubernetes uh, infrastructure. So first of all, we will uh, deploy a Keystone deployment, declared Keystone deployment here in this example, which is roughly 100 lines of YAML. So it's pretty simple. Uh, as we defined a desired count of two, Kubernetes will automatically uh, start and make sure that two uh, Keystone instances are running across our cluster at any given time. So now let's, let's consider that we have a Cinder container running somewhere. How can this Cinder uh, container discuss with uh, Keystone? So where we have a uh, Kubernetes cluster, we do also have a network overlay. This can be powered by Canal, Flannel, Calico, WeaveNet, uh, or even uh, advanced uh, stuff like OpenVSwitch. So now technically we understand that uh, Cinder 
can technically discuss with uh, Keystone because everyone has an IP address. Well, but that's not great because we do not want to deal with these IP addresses and because they're, they're maybe dynamic and stuff. So instead, we should write uh, 10 or 215 more lines of YAML to get ourselves a Keystone service, which is another Kubernetes object. Uh, it has a service IP and it will load balance the traffic that is directed to that service IP to any of the containers that are labeled with the same, uh, that, are, that have the same labels. So here we have application equal keystone and version equal one. So that's pretty cool. I mean, in the Cinder, uh, Cinder could communicate using uh, this virtual IP, but we don't really need to, we don't really want to deal with any of these IP addresses and, and stuff that, again, can be dynamically uh, assigned. Um, so furthermore, um, Kubernetes will periodically probe any of the running containers to make sure they're healthy. And if they're not healthy, then they won't receive any traffic. And they will be killed automatically by Kubernetes and be rescheduled automatically. Um, so the, the health checks can be done by either a simple HTTP probe or more advanced uh, scripts for testing MoriaDB and such, for instance. Um, so, well, how can uh, actually Cinder communicate with that virtual IP because it's a virtual IP that is not rootable. It's in the 10.3 uh, range, where the network is in the 10.2 range. Um, that's where we have Kube Proxy, which is a Kubernetes infrastructure uh, container running everywhere, and uh, queries the service IP. Like It gets basically every service IP and the list of healthy containers for that service. And then it creates IP table rules with probabilities on each node. Therefore, when Cinder tries to communicate with 10.3, the packets are going to be rewritten to discuss with one of the healthy uh, Keystone container on the 10.2 range. Um, so like I said, it's pretty cool, right? But we do not want to deal with any IP addresses. So instead, we're going to consider another uh, Kubernetes infrastructure container, which is called kubedns. And this thing will simply ask the service name and the service IP of every service is declared, right? So now, that's pretty cool, because Cinder can uh, discuss with Keystone by just saying, well, query Keystone, right? It's, it's the same thing with any of the OpenStack services, of course. Um, we could go a bit further uh, and say that this internal load balancing should also be external load balancing. So to do this, we declare an ingress resource, which is, again, roughly 10 to 15 YAML lines, with a host name, uh, a service name and path, and optionally TLS certificates. With the help of a third Kubernetes application uh, called an ingress controller that can be, it's essentially a black box. It can run internally, like HAProxy, Nginx, traffic, et cetera, but you don't really want, uh, you, you don't really need to know what it is, right? Uh, you just have to know that it's going to use all the ingress resources uh, to basically expose externally on an external network, a public network, whatsoever you have, on a specific port or service. Therefore, you will be able to um, query Keystone from anywhere. Um, so, so far, we, deployed, we declared three objects. We, deploy, we declared uh, a deployment, a service and an ingress. It's roughly like 200 lines of YAML. So that's pretty short. And we've got a scalable service with self-healing self capabilities, internal and external advancing, and also service discovery. That's a little, it's a very little effort. But we could go a bit further. So um, this is, uh, so Kubernetes is able to perform updates. Basically, there are two ways to do it. Uh, the more standard way, I guess, that everyone would know is a traffic shifting method uh, where we will deploy another Keystone deployment. For instance, here I said V2, but it can be just a configuration change. Um, Kubernetes will again create the containers for it automatically. And then we will simply change uh, the, the label on the service to say, well, now you have to serve V2. Uh, V2 pod instead of uh, V1 uh, services. But more interestingly, you can do rolling updates, right? So we will again deploy a Keystone V2, but this time instead, Kubernetes will automatically uh, reduce the number of V1 containers and start starting V2 containers instead to eventually only have our new um, containers running, therefore uh, being on entirely on the new stack. Um, so I've presented some of the most basic bricks of Kubernetes 
uh, Kubernetes do have way more features than that, we, that way more advanced features that we're going to uh, describe here in such a short amount of time. Uh, but recently, we got some uh, nice features as well um, over the summer, such as pet sets, which are very useful for clustered uh, stateful applications such as Galera. Um, we've got node affinity and anti-affinity, uh, which goes into the same uh, pattern. Uh, we have init containers as well for all the initialization tasks that we, we might have to do. A scheduled job for all the maintenance that we may have to do. Or, uh, dynamic persistent volume provisioning as well, which is quite cool, and uh, Rocket support. So Rocket uh, is an alternative uh, container engine uh, that has been uh, built from the ground up for composability, security, and built on standards. You can start using it uh, on Kubernetes with a simple single flag. So it's very easy. It has various advantages. Uh, one of them being the fact that there is no daemon that runs the container, so there is no single point of failure around this, and you can um, live update the, the engine. It has also some very advanced uh, security features, uh, including the, the fact that you can uh, run some containers with a simple ch root isolation, but you might also run containers with a more standard C groups based isolation, or even go all the way with a full virtualization. I will now hand on to Piotr, who will talk about dependencies, management, and stuff. Yeah, so we talked a lot about the Kubernetes, but OpenStack itself, like installation of it, is not a trivial task. One has to follow certain uh, rules and sequence of deploying services and do some kind of batch jobs as registering endpoints, create databases, etc. In Kubernetes, it looks even more challenging because you have dynamic host names and IPs, and Kubernetes was not designed for stateful application and it has no native support for interpot dependencies. So we tried to make OpenStack services more self-aware of their dependencies. So that's why we developed an application. We developed applications, so we divided them into the two groups. One is a container level dependency management stuff. So there is a few LCP entry point. So we keep it as a Docker entry point or the container entry point. It works on Rocket 2. So the state of the deployment is kept in etcd, and each container before launching an exot service is uh, checking its dependencies via key value store as etcd. We also have a second approach, a Kubernetes entry point. So we are not using any key value store, but the application is querying Kubernetes API. It's uh, inside of inside on, in, in container directly, and it's checking its dependency through Kubernetes. So there is another approach, a cluster level, uh, dependency management, uh, another orchestration layer. Example is Kubernetes app controller. So user is specifying a deployment graph, and the Kubernetes app controller is following it in, with deploying application. So we had also problems with uh, a stateful application on top of Kubernetes. One of them is clustering MySQL with Galera. So to do it, we just are creating a Kubernetes job as a primary component of Galera cluster, and then using peer finder script to find another peers of Galera, Galera cluster. And then when the Kubernetes job, which is running primary component, see that the cluster is formed, it's killing itself. So under any circumstances, the cluster won't be reformed. And we use local storage for performance. Uh, another uh, big thing is RabbitMQ. So we used uh, the RabbitMQ auto cluster plugin with etcd backend. The uh, RabbitMQ is keeping its state in etcd and uh, doing a TTL. So after a brain split, the um, RabbitMQ node with the highest TTL will, be, will become master to easily recover from brain split. And uh, thanks to new features in RabbitMQ, we can use in configuration files IP addresses instead of host names. It's cool. So another thing is Nova Kubernetes drain. So we will try to make uh, Kubernetes uh, aware of OpenStack deployment and not treat it specially. So for example, running kubectl drain command, which is basically uh, putting a Kubernetes mode e a node in the maintenance mode, we are uh, catching this event through the uh, Kubernetes event stream and triggering auto evacuation. So first we are, we are disabling the node in OpenStack and then do live migration all of the nodes, uh, all of the VMs from the node. 
Yeah, and I will pass to Sergei. Actually, I, I want to read, continue the idea of this, of this slide. Um, uh, the overall idea behind the fuel CP and the stack analysis, uh, I think, uh, is that there is a very important thing to uh, separate the layers uh, of, uh, let's say, bare metal, LCM, Kubernetes provisioning, and OpenStack provisioning to make them uh, like self-containing and self-sufficient while not mixing them between each other. That's why we were doing this uh, like Kubernetes native application from OpenStack, not just running containers on, uh, on uh, Kubernetes. Uh, that's that's possible as well. You can you can run containers in Kubernetes and orchestrate with Ansible, but it's more or less the same if you will be doing like on a, on a plain Docker probably, and it's not using the benefits of Kubernetes. And this concrete feature about the draining after draining the workload from OpenStack on a Kubernetes operation site, it's actually a very essential part of uh, this stuff. Because uh, the operator of Kubernetes don't need to know about the workload that is running on OpenStack, and uh, he can just run the usual operations on a Kubernetes site, and it will automatically uh, deal with the workload. So the same, I think, approach uh, is, uh, is a valuable and needed for any, any workload running on Kubernetes and the separation of the layers provides the ability to not worry about the like, upper layers and, uh, and to not uh, oversee the, like, the approach of trying to uh, going from, uh, uh, from, like, from upper layer to down layer. So you only, you only should know what's uh, What's behind? What, what, what's the layer uh, uh, like? Or the underlay part? Okay. Um, so for the scale, uh, it's it's uh, specifically about the fuel CCP. Uh, that's what we were able to run uh, so far, and uh, it's like not not probably very very huge scale. We were running on uh, up to 350 machines uh, with like 340 computes out of them, something like this. Um, so all the test plans used uh, scenarios and uh, results are published on the scale and performance uh, working group. So you can like find the like, fancy charts uh, and the more detailed data there. I, I just want to go through the highlights and uh, some, some issues that we face in uh, when running CompenStack on Kubernetes on some, some at least small scale. So um, on the highlight side, uh, we were running uh, in general the various combinations of boot and list and boot and create scenarios for Nova virtual machines with and without network interfaces. And uh, for the KIST one, we were running the authentication scenario to test the RPS, uh, as it's like as we know from our experience with MOS, it's uh, one of the main things that's uh, going to block everything on a, some significant scale. So we wasn't doing uh, any tuning of uh, services uh, intentionally. We were just willing to see what will be the initial results and the comparing to like the usual deployments. It wasn't bad. It was like 20 to 10 percent uh, worse than. Uh, uh, than the usual deployments, and it's one more time I want to explicitly repeat that it's it's without any tuning done. So, during this process uh, of enabling different tuning for the OpenStack components and the uh, Kubernetes itself, we were seeing like significant increase of our performance, and uh, we still not completed it. So, like we, we will probably see even better performance than uh, bare metal due to some. Uh, abilities to distribute services, for example, across the nodes, and uh, uh, like with with fuel CCP and stack analysis, you can very very easily distribute your services. Uh, you don't need to run the whole control plane on a single node. You don't need to. I honestly I don't know how it's done in stack analysis, but like in fuel CCP, you, you define your roles on, on the go, and you can say that okay, we can run run Keystone on a, on these three machines and. Uh, on one of the computes, and for example, uh, for scale, you need to run additional uh, Nova schedulers and especially Nova conductors. And we, for the scale testing, we were even trying the scenario to distribute all of the control plane services across of, across of all of the computes, just like running one compute service per per compute. It was it's it's not something for for production, but it's very interesting that it's uh, it's very easily 
possible to be done through such such framework. Um, another scene is actually that um, for fuel CCP, we build it on containers from sources. You can build it from uh, from a, just a source folder uh, on your local computer and uh, just update the cloud from it, so you can tune. Uh, both configuration and uh, uh, the code of the OpenStack component on the go, and it takes like for me, I was like personally trying to, to tune like Kist on on a on a scale, and it was uh, like two three minutes uh, before the attempts and before the changes uh, between the changes. I mean, so it's like much much faster comparing to like what we were using before, and uh, it's only time to build a single, rebuild a single container and uh, push it to Kubernetes to make this rolling upgrade that Quentin was uh, covering. Uh, now a bit about the issue that we were facing. I want to, to say that all of them was not real blockers, uh, and some of them was fixed already, and some have like good workarounds. So uh, I will probably start from the end. Uh, when we half year ago started thinking about the test and fuel CCP on a scale, we faced the first issue. There is nothing like uh, on the market to, to install Kubernetes on scale, uh, and uh, like we were evaluating different uh, different solutions, and uh, we ended up with a cargo, uh, and we uh, write uh, some some small wrapper around it uh, named fuel CCP installer that just installed the Kubernetes and all new stuff. Uh, for Ion Fuel CCP, and uh, in addition to it, we were uh, uh, contributing a lot to Cargo. And the last release, a 2.0 release, uh, contains like lots of features to run uh, Kubernetes in a different ways, like in containers or from binaries with Calico Flannel. Uh, so it's uh, right now it's a kind of a very uh, fancy installer for Kubernetes that supports different operation systems and. Uh, uh, we tested it on this 400 node scale, uh, and uh, we like, virtually pre-tested on the 1,000 nodes, and uh, done needed optimizations for running it on this 1,000 nodes. So, like, our our next step will be to try all of this stuff on the 1,000 nodes. And we uh, like right now we're thinking about first try on a vir uh, like emulated environments with uh, probably computes on the virtual machines, and then to switch to bare metal to have a more more real results as our experience showing that it's very very different uh, results showing when you're emulating the scale and uh, uh, having a real scale. So the next issue, obviously, was how to distribute all these Docker uh, images when you're building them on a single node and push into registry, and all 400 nodes don't have these images, and then you're running the services, it's, I think, four or six containers uh, on a compute node. Uh, they are sharing some, some common part, but, for example, a neutron agent and uh, OVS with VGD share only the first layer of uh, like the first uh, guest operation system, so they have a like pretty huge diff. And the Docker registry itself was showing that it's not enough just to run Docker registry, and uh, like the, here we were doing some optimizations on the container uh, image size. And um, another thing that we started just deploying registry. Uh, inside the Kubernetes uh, and exposing it to all hosts uh, through the service. And uh, it's actually improved a lot uh, the way how the load distributed uh, and uh, how it's working uh, in general. And we just like mounting the host, uh, host directory to, to the registry to, to increase the performance as well. So it's like on 400 nodes, it works well. Uh, for the larger scale, we uh, we believe that it will stop working, and we look on uh, two options. First is to scale the Docker registry itself, uh, like run a few instances, um, probably try another, uh, another backends, uh, like Artifactory or something else. And another approach is that we're looking on a, a torrent-based uh, distribution of the Docker images using the like, import-export or safe load features of a Docker just to distribute the like, image binaries uh, across, all, uh, across all nodes and uh, load them locally uh, to the Docker. Next issue that we uh, were facing, starting from probably 50 nodes uh, testing, 
it was a slowness of a cube DNS and a very low reliability. So it was like failing, uh, showing all data, and uh, it was like really not working even on 50 nodes under the load, for sure. Like, uh, but it was, uh, I think it was 1.2 Kubernetes half of a year ago, and uh, with, uh, with the new versions, it was improved uh, dramatically, and now it works like thousands of times better. And we, uh, in addition to this uh, improvements done in upstream, uh, and some of them was done by, by Mirantis guys working on the Kubernetes team, we run in the DNS mask on each node uh, to cache uh, DNS requests to the kube DNS uh, locally on each node, and uh, it's uh, like obviously by bypassing to the uh, Docker containers that we run in. Uh, so it's like additional layer of uh, uh, like decreasing the load on a kube DNS. And the last thing that uh, we were facing for the whole times is a Docker daemon freezing. So uh, on a, on a scale after some containers restarting and some I don't know bad moon phase, uh, Docker daemon can freeze and uh, is just stopping answering any API calls. Uh, and here it was a Lots of uh, improvements done in the, late, in the last uh, minor releases of Docker, but still it's sometimes happening. So, uh, so that's like we're using it right now as a, as a marker of how good Kubernetes survived it. Uh, so right now it means that usually only one node will have a Docker frozen, so it's, it's not affecting workloads. It's a kind of usual hardware outage or anything else. So we, we're working on this issue and we're trying to find the, like a root cause. And uh, we, so far we find out that there are like different reasons for, for this thing happening. It's just interesting that the, the, same, the, same, oops, the same outcome uh, is visible for people when, uh, when, uh, when there's like demon freezing. And uh, it, this bug, if you will search for, for such kind of a bug on a Docker uh, bug tracker, it was fixed, I don't know, like probably a dozen of times, and it's still happening sometimes. Okay, um, so I think that's all from my side that I was willing to, to share about the scale testing, and uh, I wanted to switch to, uh, uh, to the short demo recordings. It's, it's not really like a demo, it's, it's uh, like highlighting, lightning uh, recordings of, of how it works. So the first part is just want to show how the deployment uh, looks like and then how some simple operations like scaling up, changing configs and changing images, obviously rolling upgrades uh, looks like. And we have this uh, recording for after drain feature as well. So let me switch to... Okay, so... Um, uh, for field CPN stack analysis for both, we're using the separated namespace to deploy OpenStack. Uh, and uh, for this recording, I was using a 30 nodes lab uh, and running a compute on the first five nodes, probably, a bit distributed uh, between them. And uh, all other nodes were just used for the compute. So uh, just here it is showing that there is nothing yet deployed. And uh, after that, uh, like for both tools, there are a command line uh, interface uh, that you're working with, and you need to, to define the metadata uh, in, a, in a config file. So for fuel CCP, it's just a simple YAML file that have uh, information about the way uh, where you need to find the Docker registries, uh, tags for images, namespace for Kubernetes, some configuration like which interface to bootstrap for Neutron, how many replicas for each service to run because it's, uh, it's decoupled from the topology because sometimes you want to run probably like two keystones on the same node just to increase the performance because it's like not always scaling uh, well in a, in a one instance. So uh, after that, you can just uh, run the deploy commands. Uh, I think that for, for stack analysis, it's, it's a keep KPM deploy uh, and for space CCP deploy. So uh, after running it, it will get these DSLs and this config file and compile them into the native uh, Kubernetes objects. And it will just push them to the Kubernetes itself. And uh, on that point of time, the work of a CLI is ended. 
the same for the stechanitis. So the CLI is uh, technically just, uh, just a compiler from a DSL that describes how services should run on OpenStack uh, on a Kubernetes and uh, just compiling it to the native Kubernetes application together with all configuration and uh, uh, all new stuff to run. So uh, I think for both projects using the Kubernetes jobs for the bootstrapping and here you can see like these single time operations uh, like creating databases, uh, synchronizing them, creating the users and endpoints. Uh, so all of them are uh, described as a jobs in a Kubernetes and uh, it's like na natively running on Kubernetes and Kubernetes will ensure that uh, these jobs will succeed. Um, and the, if, if they will be failing, it will restart them on the, on the, on the other nodes. So we don't need to uh, implement our like, retries for creating you know, like some endpoints or installation database. Uh, Kubernetes will do it for ourselves. So uh, we're using the deployments to run the usual services and the daemon sets to, uh, to run the services that we need to have on, our, on uh, each node. So I will probably a bit speed up it because we have it's less time. Um, so here is a, is a view of jobs uh, that's, that are currently running as single time operations. And uh, uh, <clears throat> for both projects, we, uh, we just need to wait for all uh, jobs to be completed to, to name OpenStack uh, up and running. So uh, in that case, you see that all, like, all desired state is uh, achieved so we can try to, uh, to access OpenStack with, uh, with like, here I'm using the OpenStack as CLI uh, to, to make some comments uh, to, to verify that OpenStack works. Uh, in general, we have in both projects uh, the readiness probes uh, configured in a Kubernetes for each service. So it's, uh, there are exposing the real healthness of an application and each component uh, to Kubernetes. So when you get in the list of pods, for example, and see uh, the readiness of pods, it means it's not, not just container running, but uh, something inside the container is really working. Um, so uh, next thing that I want to show in this video is that how we gonna to uh, make some simple, simple operations. So, uh, uh, let's like let's scale up the keystone. Like by default, we have a replica one for everything, uh, and uh, it's currently running out of a Newton tag. So we can override uh, the specific uh, image spec uh, for the keystone, for example, to run the, it's from a Kata uh, Docker image, run the three instances, and enable debug and keystone. So it means that we do in a single time three operations. We scan up Keystone, change it in its config uh, in a Keystone conf, Oslo config file, and uh, we are <coughs> we are switching the image from uh, from the old one to to the new one. I just uh, associating to the node that running Keystone to show that uh, it's running the old version. <clears throat> and after that, I'm, uh, I'll be running the command to, to apply. So, uh, and here I'm showing that there is no debug logs, only info logs in a keystone uh, logs, so the real upgrade will happen. Um, so one more time, like we change in the tag, change in the value for the debug and change in the replicas, and after that, for both uh, StackNet and CCP, we just need to rerun the deploy command and it will regenerate uh, all needed state and push it to Kubernetes. And after that, it will be, it will be natively resolved in the Kubernetes uh, what needs to be restarted. And uh, actually here, Kubernetes will run this rolling upgrade for Keystone. And as you can see, there is one container with the old version running uh, for nine minutes and the three new ones running uh, for like 20 seconds. And uh, when they're starting to show in their uh, healthy, uh, as a healthy in a Kubernetes, it will just kill the old one. So after that, we can, we can try that still uh, Keystone works by running the project list command. And, uh, uh, and uh, after that, uh, I'm going to show that uh, logs uh, starting showing 
the debug. So I've just uh, run the kubectl log uh, for one of the running containers and now have a lot of a debug uh, lines and uh, like that's uh, kind of everything that uh, I was willing to show on that side. Uh, so we already, I think I have only five minutes uh, till the end, so I will probably not show that uh, this after drain stuff. It's uh, it's just working very obviously by running the kubectl drain node, and uh, the workload will be automatically migrated from uh, from <coughs> from the node uh, using the live migration feature of OpenStack. Uh, another thing that we need to show is a uh, like legal notice and disclaimer. Hello, Intel. Uh, and uh, that's like last slide we have about the, like some useful links and our names one more time. So like thanks for our attention, like some questions. Yep. You tried using uh, clay, uh, clay instead of. Uh, so we uh, we were running it on a private labs. Uh, are you talking? I, I, do you mean like uh, hosted clay or? Yeah, like, uh, so on our private labs, uh, there was no access to internet, so the hosted one wasn't working, and we were not trying to, uh, like we were trying Artifactory, uh, but Artifactory is showing not very good performance for Docker specifically. It's like it's it's not supporting um, divs between the common layers. It's it's fixed right now, but half of year it wasn't supporting. Uh, so few CP is currently require uh, 1.4. We well, it depends on some features that introduced in 1.4. I think the same for stack analysis. I think like, for such kind of projects, it's very important to follow the latest release and uh, leverage the uh, last like features. Yep. So in fuel speed, we're not right now using the pet sets. We almost have a support for them, and we're thinking about running memcached as a pet set to, like, natively uh, sh uh, use the direct uh, names of each of the hosts. Mm -hmm. And the pet set provides this ability to have uh, static names for all instances, so you can just use these names in a, in the services of OpenStack uh, without a loan balancer that directly. Right, Saganetis doesn't either use pet sets just yet. Uh, we are using some different uh, ways, as uh, Pure descri descri described, uh, with scripts and stuff. Uh, but we do plan to integrate pet sets like in the coming weeks, uh, as it just got released. Yeah. Uh, actually, in 1.5, there is uh, uh, most probably updates for pet sets will be merged. So without the pet set updates, it's not very interesting to use them as a limiting the uh, functionality or upgrading. Right. Yeah, yeah. The same actually with the daemon sets. We like if 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 the updates for daemon sets will not be merged in the 1.5, we just <coughs> migrate everything to deployments and we'll use only them and fill CCP. How about Ceph? Is it in the so uh, in a fuel CP, we're using just a third-party installation of Ceph. You just need to, uh, if you want to have like a Cinder volume with a Ceph backend, or Glance with a Ceph backend, or Rados gateway. Uh, so we run on all of this stuff on Kubernetes, but you need to uh, provide access to the external deployed Ceph. So, right, not so, so sorry. So yeah, with, with Stackanetis, it's, it's essentially the same. Uh, you can or not use Ceph. You, you just decide in a parameter as a single parameter. And then you, you may uh, deploy Ceph as part of communities or not, like depending on your existing infrastructure or not. Any other questions? All right. Yeah. Yeah. In the, in the read, I just checked the read, it says that uh, with, if you want to use Cinder, you have to use Ceph. So it doesn't work with any other Cinder package. Right. Yes, yeah, so right, right now it's Takanetes. Since with Cinder, we only support Ceph. Yeah, same for Fuel CP. We just know Ceph better. Uh, you can always like make a pull request for it, and we'll happily to update it. Yeah, we don't know any technical reason not to do it. Yeah. 
So as I was saying like, uh, in, the, in the beginning of the talk, um, we, like both projects uh, have a goal to have a separation between layers. So we just don't care about what's happening on the bare metal level. And we just expect that there is a Kubernetes available with some list of prerequisites installed on a, on a host operation system needed to run OpenStack. But uh, the next layer is managed uh, like separately. Right, so, so we do assume that you already have a Kubernetes cluster running with all the nodes available and whatnot, right? Now, um, so this is for the stack and fuel CPP part of it. Uh, but of course, like Kubernetes does have uh, discovery for, for bare metal nodes, etc. Uh, so at, at Corest, we, we will mainly use IPXC uh, to, to bring up nodes, and they will automatically register to the Kubernetes cluster. Cool, awesome. Thank you.